Many of you know that I grew up in a small town in northern Spain called Rubena. When I grew up, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have computers. In fact, we had televisions, but there was only one channel, a state-run channel. And so what we did, we just figured out how to have fun outside, outdoors. And uh, in one of these occasions, me and my buddies decided to, well, we were kind of bored, and so we decided to create a zip line. And so we tied a rope from one tree that was about 30 feet in the air down to another tree that was maybe 100 feet away that was lower, and we got a little pulley, and we experimented on going down this pulley and the zip line all the way from 30 feet high to 10 feet, and it was a blast. Except there was a kid by the name of Tito, and Tito was from the city, not from the village. And you know how those city kids are. He didn't know how to climb a tree very well. He didn't know how to do those outdoor things very well. And so Tito said, I want to do it. He was a little older than me. I was about 10. And I said, Tito, we'll let you do it. But remember, I took him up to the high tree and I said, there's only one thing, one thing you need to remember. Before you reach the bottom, you need to let go. If you don't, you're going to crash into that tree. Tito, what do you have to do? One thing he said, let go. I said, okay. So Tito, very fearful, got a hold of that pulley, and he jumped. And he was going down, and I saw his face, and he was frozen in fear going down. And when he passed us a few feet from the tree, I said, let go, let go. And he was gripping that thing with all that he could, and he did not let go, and wham, into that tree he went. He did a flip up in the air, he fell on the ground, and he broke his wrist. I said, Tito, there's one thing you had to remember, one thing, let go. I just couldn't let go. And so I had to take him to his mother, I was about 10, and tell him our silly game that broke his wrist. Let me tell you, today in this auditorium, there are some of you that have to remember to do one thing. One thing. It's one thing that could literally change your life. Some of you are limping with a broken spirituality because there's one thing that you need to do and you are failing to do the one thing that could turn your life around. And so today, I want to talk to you about that one thing. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 38 through 42 of Luke chapter 10. The account is about two sisters. You may have heard of them. One sister is named Martha. The other sister is named Mary. And although this account doesn't speak of it, they had a brother and his name was Lazarus. You may remember the story of Lazarus because Lazarus is the one that got sick and he died. Jesus shows up four years, four days after they've buried him, goes to the gravesite and resurrects him. Lazarus, people knew about him all over because he was the guy that was dead. And because of the words of Jesus, he was resurrected. But what you may not be as familiar with is the dynamic between these two sisters called Mary and Martha. I want to read the text starting in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. I'm reading out of the ESV version. It says, now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and you are troubled 
about many things. But one thing, but one thing is necessary. Can you say one thing out loud? Now, just for dramatic effect, can you raise up your finger like this and just say one thing? I want you to remember, not two, not three, not four, not five, one thing. Jesus says, but one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen a good portion, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, I want to pause just a second and say that this is a contrast between two sisters. Now, when Jesus says one thing is necessary, not two, not three, not four, but one thing that will have a dramatic effect on your life, then I want to sit up and listen and say, what is that one thing? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him in a posture of humility, in his presence, absorbing all that he had, while she listened intently to the words of Jesus. In his presence, with humility, receiving what he had to say. One thing. Martha, on the other end, was scurrying around, running around, worried, anxious, agitated, stressed, full of all kinds of things she was trying to do and seemed like she couldn't get them all done. And although Jesus was in the house, she absolutely, 100%, Missed the fact that the Son of God, the Messiah himself, was present. He was present, but she was not. I want to talk to you about what happens when we neglect the one thing. Martha actually, Jesus diagnoses her a little bit later on, and she sa he says, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Let me say, look up at me, this is important. There are people right now in this auditorium that you are anxious and troubled about many things. In fact, there are people in this auditorium right now that as I speak, you, have a, you will have trouble concentrating on what I have to say because your mind is preoccupied about the things that are troubling you. During our worship time, people were raising their hands and some were sensing the presence of God. And there are some of you that participated in the same worship, but you were disconnected and disengaged because your mind is racing with a lot of anxiety and worry and stress over things that mostly you cannot control, but that weigh you down. And so I want to talk to you about that because I believe that we are living in a time that so many people are stressed out, so many people are anxious, so many people are frustrated. In fact, mental health experts believe there's a pandemic happening that is out of control. 40 million Americans, as I speak today, have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders. That means not that they worry occasionally about something, but that their anxiety is so severe that they can't really function at a job, in their schools, that they can't really engage in their normal activities because of this anxiety disorder. Here's what happens when we don't practice the one thing and we let worry, stress, and anxiety overwhelm us. There's four things that I see from this passage that were happening to Martha that may be happening to you. Number one, it distracts us from being fully present at important moments. Verse 40 says, but Martha, it says Jesus was in the house, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Martha was what? Distracted. That word distracted in the Greek means driven about mentally, distracted, overoccupied, too busy. She was distracted from what? She was distracted from the presence of Jesus. Think about it for a moment. The I am is in the house. 
the Messiah, the one that had been prophesied 800 years before that he was coming, the one that was pre-existence that has never had a beginning that was with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the beginning, the God that was there when the stars were thrown into the universe and the earth was formed out of its darkness, Jesus the Messiah, the Logos, the Word, the pre-existing one that became incarnate to dwell among us, he was in the house. Not just spiritually in the house, he was physically flesh and blood in her living room. And instead of hearing, listening, living in the moment, she was nervous, agitated, preoccupied, anxious, missing the very thing that was important in the moment. Because listen to me, what anxiety and worry does is it causes you to miss what is right in front of you. Can I tell you something? Some of you are missing the fact that you're 13 year old is in a stage of life that he really needs you to be present, but you're so preoccupied, it's hard for you to be present. Some of you are in marriages that, yeah, you physically come home, but your mind is elsewhere, and occasionally your wife will elbow you and say, could you be present? What she's saying is, could you engage in the conversation that your 13-year-old or 12-year-old is trying to have with you? Could you be mentally present, emotionally present, could you be here because you're about to miss some very important moments in life because you are preoccupied? Hey, all of us know that you can be physically there and not really there. How about it? Ever happened to you? You're talking and you really know that that person's really not listening. Hello? Oh, I... It happens to me occasionally. Even on Sunday morning, I see you. <laughs> you know that you can be physically present, but I look at you, that blank stare in your eye means I'm over here, I'm not engaged, I'm, I'm thinking about three other things. And you're, oh, your eyes are open, you're looking in the front, but I know you're not there. You're way off somewhere or thinking about other things because what happens with worry and anxiety, it takes us out of the present moment. It takes us out of the here and now, and it causes us to live in the future, in the past, or somewhere else, whatever is distracting us and causing us to be worried. Mary was missing the moment of her lifetime, the moment that Jesus was in the house, the words of the Messiah. She was missing it because she was stressed, Worried, preoccupied, and overburdened about other things. They tell us that anxiety has reached all-time highs in our country. And at first we thought, well, it's the pandemic, it's the mask, it's the vaccination, it's all of that, but... Recent studies tell us that in 2024, the levels of anxiety are higher than they were last year. Why? We don't really fully know why. Maybe because there's a polarizing, controversial presidential election. Maybe because the economy is a bit unstable and shaky and people aren't sure exactly where it's going to land. Maybe it's because the gun violence in our country seems to be out of control and parents are afraid to drop their kids off at school. Maybe it's because there are international wars and tension both in Europe and in the Middle East. Regardless of the reasons, there is a preoccupation, an anxiety, a level of stress that is affecting people like few decades before us. So not only does it cause us not to be present, fully present in the moment, anxiety and worry and stress, it makes us feel disconnected and pulls us into a dark cycle. Notice that Martha, not only was she missing the moment to listen to Jesus, but the Bible tells us that she actually gets so frustrated that she looks at Jesus and she says, don't you care? She's questioning whether 
The one that is the Messiah, her Lord, she knew who Jesus was, but she's questioning whether God cares about her. When you start to feel overwhelmed, when your circumstances start to feel like they're just caving in on you, you start to wonder, does God even care what I'm going through? Does he know? Does he hear? Does he see? Lord, do you even care? Number three, it manifests in anger towards the people that are closest to us. When you start to struggle with anxiety, worry, frustration, stress, it can lead to two places. It can, one, lead you to the vortex of depression. If you live with anxiety long enough, it starts to drag you into a dark hole. And you start to feel like, I'm never going to get out of this dark hole. You lose your joy. You see everything through the lenses of gloom. And you no longer see a hopeful future. The other place it can take you is a place of anger. Why is this happening to me? Why aren't people helping out? Why doesn't anybody care? And you lash out in anger. And usually, your anger affects the people that are closest to you. I just heard a story yesterday. Someone was telling me about their nephew, that uh, went to grab a peach and banged his head against a cabinet that was open, and he grabbed the peach and he squeezed it, and he said, that stupid peach. Well, let me tell you, the peach had nothing to do with it, but the peach became the object of the wrath because when you're angry and stressed and hurting, you feel like you need to lash out at someone or something. Your dog has nothing to do with your stress at work, but your dog can become that dog. Your child has nothing to do with what's happening at work, but when they come in, da-da-da-da, how you doing? It's why are these toys here? And Why does this kid's diaper not change? And you can become your wife, your kids, your coworker, your spouse, your date, people that are closest to you, when you are under stress, when you are under worry, when you are under anxiety, it lashes out at someone. And typically the people that are closest to you are the people that are the victims of your discontentment. Number four, it creates a chain reaction that spills into many areas of life. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Notice Jesus says many things. He uses two words to describe her state of mind. He says worried, which means anxious or overcome with burdens, and upset, which has to do with being disquieted or troubled in her mind. So he says, Martha, Martha. When I look at you, Martha, I see that you are anxious, overburdened, and that you are upset. And notice what Jesus says about many things. Can I tell you something about anxiety, worry, and frustration, and stress? Typically, it cannot be contained into one bucket. When you are anxious about something, it starts to spill into every bucket of your life. It may start with your health, but suddenly you're preoccupied with your health, and what's the doctor going to say, and maybe it's a bad diagnosis, and maybe I have this, and maybe it's a genetic disease, and maybe it's cancer, I can't worry about it, and you start thinking, and it spills over to your job, it spills over to your driving, it spills over to your children, it spills over to your worship, it spills over to your thinking, it spills over to how you... Uh, manage life because anxiety and worry cannot be contained. It's an emotion that's pervasive and you can't compartmentalize it. It starts to spread into a bunch of areas of your life and people once in a while that have nothing to do with your source of worry may say to you, are you okay? What's wrong with you lately? It's a sign that you've allowed your Worry, your anxiety, your emotion to spill into other areas of your life. Jesus was pointing out Mary's, Martha's condition, but he also gave her a solution. 
And I want you to notice God's solution as he addresses Martha. He says, you're worried and upset about many things, but he says only one thing is needed. One thing for what? One thing to handle your worry and anxiety. One thing to give you perspective. One thing to reset your mindset, your heart, and your attitude. Only one thing is needed. And listen to what he says. And Mary has chosen that. What's he talking about? The one thing that Jesus is talking about is the practice of being at the feet of Jesus with a posture of humility, listening to what he has to say, and releasing that which we cannot control. They were a part of the same household with the same stress, with the same problems, with the same culture, the same village, the same neighbors, the same bloodline, but one had discovered the one thing and the other had not yet quite discovered it. So I want to talk to you about the practice of the one thing and how that affects our life. Some of you know about it. Most of you have heard about it. But I would venture to say that the majority of us do not consistently practice it, the one thing. So let me talk to you a little bit about what it is and the benefits of it. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible says that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus, Jesus being all God, but yet a son, got up while all his disciples were still sleeping, and he went away to spend time with his father. Notice what it tells us in Luke. A few chapters before Luke chapter 10, for example, Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, but Jesus often, which means in a repetitive fashion, often withdrew to lonely places and prayed, spending time with the Father. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. In other words, I'm taking time aside by myself without distraction, no one around me, and I'm spending time in the presence of my Father. The one thing. What does it look like, that one thing? Well, when you practice the one thing, it helps you release the concerns that you have no control over. Hey, can you just admit there are things in life you have no control over? Let's practice this together. Say, I have no control over certain things. Some of you really struggle to say that. Because some of you struggle with being a bit of over-controllers. You have no control over the weather. You have no control over the economy. You have no control over when you live or die. You have no control really over a lot of things. There are certain things you can control, but there are a lot of things that are out of your control. And you need to learn that God is in control, that God is sovereign, that God has all power, that there is nothing beyond his ability, and you need to learn to say, God, I give this to you, because I have no control, but praise you because you have all control. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Listen, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I want you to notice that the prequel to casting your anxiety is humble yourselves. So he says, humble yourself before God. Humbling ourselves before God is, is, is admitting that we don't have all the strength, we don't have all the answers, we don't have all the wisdom, we don't have all the power, that we do not have all the solutions. And so we humble ourselves before God saying, Lord, I can't. And I don't, but you can and you do. And so I get my proper position before you, acknowledging that I can throw 
what I can't control on your shoulders and trust you with it because you actually care for me. It's a powerful concept. Casting our cares upon him because he cares for us. The second thing that the one thing does is when we practice the one thing, it helps you put life into a God storyboard. Sometimes we have our life in our storyboard, and we forget that God is the center of the storyboard. So we have to pause and recalibrate and remember that God is in this story. Psalms chapter 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. How many find it hard to be still? Just to sit in a service, your knees kind of shaking, you're getting a little twitchy, like it just to sit and be still is hard. But even if you sit and are still, to make your mind quiet down is a harder challenge. Because some of you can lay up bed at night, but your mind is racing around a thousand things. And here's what the Bible says, be still. That means physically, mentally, and spiritually. And listen, and know, that means consciously be aware of the fact that I am God. That you are not God, that he is God. So I still myself, I quiet myself, and I step into the awareness that he is God. And I just pause there. I simmer there. I'm quiet knowing that he is God. That means that he is sovereign, has power over all things, that he's omniscient, he knows all things. It means that he's immutable, he never changes because you cannot improve upon perfection. It means that he is faithful. It means that he is true. It means that he is kind, that he is loving, that he's just, that he's eternal, and that he's my God. I pause, I'm still and I think that God is God. It tells us in Psalm chapter 62, verse 5 through 6. Listen, let all that I am wait quietly before God. Let all that I am, my emotions, my body, my mind, my personality, all that I am, Wait quietly before the Lord, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I will not be shaken. You see, the psalmist is telling, him, telling himself, I need to wait quietly. It's the practice of solitude. It's the practice of quieting our heart. Some of us are comfortable with noise and agitation, but we're very uncomfortable with quiet. In fact, some of us, quiet makes us nervous. If you were raised in the city, you want noise. A little car honking, a little siren in the background, a little music playing. But you know what? Those of you who are raised in the city, when you get out into the country and it's quiet, you're like, this is eerie. Why? It's just too quiet. But let me tell you, there's something about the practice of embracing quietness, about being still. Not just still to be still, but still with an acknowledgement that God is God. It tells us over and over in the Psalms about quiet and stillness before God. And what we're saying when we're quiet and acknowledging that he's God is that we're acknowledging that God is in our story, that God is sovereign, that God paints a central part of our story, that his influence cannot be ignored, and so we quiet our soul to remind ourselves that God is in the middle of our story. Number three, the one thing practice helps us renew our inner strength. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up 
with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. What does it mean to wait? It means that when you're off to go somewhere and you're in the car and the car's running and you, you're waiting for your wife and you're just in the garage or in the driveway, you're just waiting. What does it mean? It means that you're waiting for her arrival. You're waiting for her to be ready. You're ready to go. And sometimes you can be anxious and do that little honk or uh, call up and say, hey, are, are we coming or what's going on? Waiting means that I'm paying attention to their time. Waiting means that I'm patient. To wait upon God means that I know that God is there, but I'm waiting for him to move. I'm waiting for him to, I'm attentive that he's there, but I'm waiting on him. I'm waiting for his voice. I'm waiting for his presence. I'm waiting for his movement. I'm just pausing and consciously waiting for God. That's what it means. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We're waiting for God. We're pausing and spending time just before the presence of God. I hear some of you saying, Pastor, you don't know my household. I got a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, a ten-year-old, and my husband's like a four-year-old. And so I'm, I, I got all that happening in my own household, and I can barely breathe. I go to the bathroom, and my three-year-old says, Mom, are you in there? Mom, can I come in? I'm just trying to escape. I mean, it's really hard. I'm reminded of Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement, Charles Wesley, who wrote a bunch of hymns that you would recognize. And she had an extremely difficult life, life in part because she had 19 children. You thought your house was chaotic? And I love what Susanna Wesley would do. There was always someone that needed attention, always a baby that needed someone, something, and a kid that was falling, and someone that needed her attention, and so she developed this practice. She would get in a chair, she would take her apron, and she would tell her children, when I put my apron over my head, that means I'm spending time with God. Don't bother me. And so with 19 children around her, she would put her apron over her head, her Bible under her apron, and she would read the word and find her one thing, her quiet space that gave sanity to her life and the ability to raise some awesome children that followed God and influenced the world because she found her one thing. Listen, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not telling you it's easy to find a quiet space. You may have to go to a closet in your house. You may have to go to the attic of your house. You may have to take a walk around the block. You may have to do it while you commute into work. I don't know where you're going to find your quiet space. But listen, you need to find the space where you let that one thing happen you're quiet in the presence of God, allowing him to speak to you in the presence of his word, humbly receiving what God is speaking to your life. It's the one thing, the one practice that can change your life. And lastly, number four, the one thing practice helps you hear the still small voice that can adjust your life. You know, I love 1 Kings chapter 19 because it's the story of Elijah who he actually gets overwhelmed with life full of fear, anxiety, disillusionment. He's this man of God, but he goes through a dark place. He's so disillusioned by how things have turned out that he actually becomes suicidal. He says, God, take my life. It's not worth living. There are moments in time where the darkness, the heaviness, the disappointment, the disillusionment comes in like a crashing wave and overwhelms our senses. It blocks out God. It blocks out our future. It numbs our senses. It takes away hope, and we have to raise our head above 
the waters to actually grasp a little bit of hope. Elijah was at that moment. He went to a cave. And God says to him in the cave, Elijah, what are you, what are you doing here? And then it's a very interesting, unexpected turn. The Bible says that while Elijah's in the cave, there's a mighty wind that happens, hurricane-type wind, throwing rocks around. And it's clear to say in Scripture, but God, he's not in the hurricane wind. And then there's fire, not like a little campfire. This is a brazing fire that sweeps through the entire area, the heat, the intensity. But God... He's not in the fire. And then there's an earthquake. It starts to shake and rattle and crack and rocks are cracked in two and it's rumbling and it's powerful and you think that God would be in it. But God, he's not in the earthquake. You see, many of us, we, we expect the dramatic. We want the sign in the sky. We want the shaking of the earth. We want the earthquake. We want something that will grab our attention, but typically, most often, God, he's in the whisper. The Bible tells us that after the fire, after the wind, after the earthquake, came the whisper. The whisper of God. Where God speaks to Elijah. And Elijah knows this is God. You see, when someone whispers, when you're talking and someone whispers, you stop talking because if you're talking, you can't hear. When someone whispers, you go, Ch -ch -ch, wait, wait. You lean in. What's that? When someone whispers, you turn down the music. When someone whispers, you block out the noise. When someone whispers, you get a little bit closer because you want to hear the whisper. Typically, how God speaks is through the whisper. There's something about leaning into the voice of God, leaning into the presence of God, leaning into the person of God and saying, I want to hear you, Lord. I'm quiet in my heart. I've calmed my spirit. I've turned off the radio. I'm sitting here anxious, wanting to hear you, blocked everything out. I'm hungry for you, God. That's the posture. That's the one thing. That's what God is desiring of us. And you say, well, pastor, I really want to do that. I love to do that, but I, I just don't know how to do that. I've never done it. I I want to read, but I don't know how to read. I want to pray, but I don't know how to pray. I want to get quiet, but I'm not sure I know how. Well, I'm going to give you some homework today. And I'm going to give you a couple of tools. For those of you that are just getting started, I'm going to give you just a couple of tools as we wrap things up here. I don't even remember where these come from. I've 25 years ago, we were practicing some of these, and I was teaching some not original with me, but when you go to the Word of God, let me just encourage you to practice SOAP. Acronym S-O-A-P. Remember that, SOAP. What does SOAP stand for? S, you read a portion of Scripture. Could be just three verses. O stands for observation. Make, what is God saying? What are you observing about this text? What is it saying? What are some of the, what is it telling you about God and about life and about people? What is it saying? A stands for application. And what does that mean to me? How can I apply it to my life, my work, my family, my mind, my spirit? And then P stands for prayer. Now let me pray that God gives me the ability to apply this to my life. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Now when it comes to praying, sometimes we don't know how to pray. I've 
tried to teach you how to pray for the, through the Lord's Prayer. But here's another acronym, ACTS. It stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. When you go to pray, you start with adoration. Adoration is a form of praise, but it focuses on the character of God. You are good God, loving. You are faithful. You are true. You are my Father. Thank you for access in Jesus' name. Thank you that you always listen. Thank you that you forgive. Thank you that you are ever present. Thank you that although I may be unworthy, you through your righteousness make me worthy, Lord. That's adoration. Confession has to do with confessing anything in your heart that needs to be made clean. Any pride, arrogance, deceit, lying, cheating, lust, anything in your heart that you say I need to confess it. The Bible says confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I, I clean my heart before the Lord as I'm praying. T stands for thanksgiving. Once I've cleansed my heart before the Lord, I thank God for his goodness and faithfulness, for my family and for salvation, for my ministry, for his call, for breath in my lungs, for where I'm at, that's thanksgiving. And lastly, S stands for supplication. So when you go to the word, think soap. When you go to pray, think acts. And here's the main thing. These are just tools to help you out if you're getting started. But the main thing is, are you in a posture of quietness before God Casting your burdens and saying, Lord, I'm here to listen with humility and to cast everything out that I can't control upon you and quiet my spirit to listen to your voice. The one thing. Now, as we close, I'll close with this illustration. Why did Jesus say the one thing? There's a lot of other things that we have to do in life, but it's a one thing that affects everything else. You know, when you get the first button right, all the other buttons start aligning. If you get the first button right. But you know, when you get the first button wrong, When you get the first button wrong, then all the other buttons are misaligned. You don't get your heart right before God and listen to him. It affects your marriage, your dating, your thinking, your work, your parenting, your words, your attitudes, your worship. It affects everything else in your life. When you get that one thing right, it starts to align the rest of your life. It resets you every day. So here's my challenge. You ready for this? My challenge is the one button challenge. My challenge is that you would get into the practice, and I'm going to tell you how many days. I want you to take the challenge of saying, however old I am, I will take that many days to try to practice the one thing consecutively. If you're 10, you have 10 days. If you're 80, you have a couple months. <laughs> you probably need it more because you're 80. <laughs> However old you are, my challenge is that you would get the first button right for that many days, 40 days, 35 days, 22 days, that you would say, I'm going to get the first button right. I'm going to pause and do the one thing at the beginning of every day. It can be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a half hour, but it means that you're with the word of God open, your Bible, reading a couple verses, quiet before the Lord, pausing, acknowledging that he's God, putting your cares on him reading some scripture and saying, speak to me, Lord. I want to hear. I want my heart to be soft. I want to reset my time with you in the morning so that my entire day is affected by the one thing, the merry thing in my life.